Hello and welcome to the Flower Farmers Big Weekend. Uh, we've gone virtual this year and we're delighted to bring you an experienced panel of flower growers who can tell you all a little bit more about the art and craft of flower growing, answering questions that have come through to us on social media. I'm Carol from Tuck Shop Flowers in Birmingham and I'm the co-chair of Flowers from the Farm. And if we could just go around the panel and if everyone could introduce yourself, let's start with uh, Sarah. Hello, I'm Sarah Wilman. I run my flower patch. I'm based in Wiltshire and I've been growing for about 10 years. Okay, Rhiannon. Hello, I'm Rhiannon Clark. Um, I run Blue Hill Flora and I'm just outside of Swansea and I've been running for about a year now. Okay, Carol. Hi, I'm Carol Sidon. I run Carol's Garden up in Cheshire in the northwest and I've been growing here for about eight years and I'm also a third of the business of growing flowers who will be run online workshop. Okay well now we've got some questions that have been sent in to us uh, from various people all over the place so if we can start off then with a question from Andrea Guthrie saying <laughs> which cut flowers have been the most useless and why? Um, Sarah, can we start with you on that one? Oh, thanks. Um, <clears throat> most useless. This year, unfortunately, my Calibri poppies haven't been very good, um, which is a real shame because they're a really expensive seed. But um, partly because I haven't been doing events this year due to unforeseen circumstances, um, but they just don't seem to have been something I've harvested much this year, which okay. is a shame because normally I love them. All right, Rihanna, what about you? Have you had anything you couldn't use? Anything you couldn't use? Um, I think for me, probably poppies again, Icelandic poppies this time. I've just found them a real pain because normally they don't last very long. So normally they go to weddings and things like that. But with none of that happening, it's been predominantly wholesale and retail. So they just don't have the vase life that I need, mm. unfortunately. But Carol, have you ever produced this once? Well, I can't answer this. So I would say it's that thing about having the right flower for the right customer or the right time. And it's the same as having the right plant for the right place in gardening. So poppies are great flowers when you've got weddings and events on, but they're not great for going in bunches. So if you're growing for your home, they're lovely because you can't buy them. So I would always grow poppies. But so I, I don't think there are any disastrous flowers. It's just the right setting or the right purpose for them. Yeah. Okay, lovely. And our next question is from uh, Roseanne Denimore. She says, as somebody about to embark on growing cup flowers, what are the most important marketing initiatives that I should be engaging in? Now, as a business of flowers lady, I'm going to start with Carol on this one. <laughs> uh, well, I would say photographs. The, for me, the biggest thing that you can do is you, you can't sell anything that you're doing if you're selling as a business without having photographs on it. It took me a long time to really learn that lesson and I'm still not great at it. I still get forget to take pictures of weddings that I've done, you know, because you get carried up with the event and doing it. But taking photographs, getting professional photographs, now it's more into video, which is even harder and I really, really don't like doing that. But <laughs> having photographs and then using social media are the biggest things that have made the biggest difference to me. And particularly this year doing retail, switching into more retail selling. So selling to my local market, Facebook has for the first time ever for me really been the biggest point of sale for me. Okay. Sara, you're fairly experienced as well. What would you, what would you say was a big uh, marketing initiative that people should take? Finding a local networking group that you really gel with. Um, I've been a member of a local group um, and it's been really good. It's um, helped me get to know different business people. I get referrals. There's no, um, it's not one of those ones where you get, you have to refer a certain number of people per month, but I get genuine referrals there um, and you just get known by other people in the area social media is huge um, it's a free marketing initiative apart from the fact that it takes your time um, it is very time heavy if you do it properly and if you're new to starting out with social media pick one and do it really well don't try and do everything just pick one um, platform that you feel comfortable and confident with and work on that till you've got it to a standard that you are happy with before you branch out into another one. But I'm, I'm the same as Carol, 
uh, Facebook and Instagram for me have brought in new customers. When I put up pretty fit photos of flowers, um, people love them and want to want to buy them. So it's great. And Rihanna, as a newbie um, coming in, what, what would you say? Would you have any advice to give other people who are just starting out? What 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 have you found successful for your marketing? I think, like Sarah said, what you're comfortable with. Like for me, it's been Instagram. I'm a very visual person. I was creative in my past career and I love photography. So again, like Carol said, like do a photography course if you can really get to know how to work with light and uh, composition and things and maybe take inspiration from other people. Like I've got a board of photographs that other people have done where I've gone like, this is a really nice vibe that I'm trying to instill with my business. And I think Instagram, yeah, it's just like 90% of my business has come through that. I do a little bit of Facebook, but it's something that I find a bit more tricky to work with. It's something I'd like to do eventually. Um, but then also website. So my two main things that I use for marketing is my website and my Instagram. Okay. And that's, they're the key these days. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, so then our next question is uh, about equipment. Uh, what's one piece of flower farming kit that you could never be without? And I think we've covered cameras, so we don't, we don't yeah. talk anymore about our cameras being a, a key piece of kit. But so what's the key, what's your piece of kit? Uh, Carol Sidon, what would you say? I'm going to just swerve. Oh. <laughs> my snips. <laughs> I, thought, I thought they were in my pocket, which they often are, they usually are, but no, they were just on the table there. Um, I would actually I would say phone and camera but aside from that then it would be snips because that's the one thing so these are um, Japanese snips that you can get easily online uh, by a company called Nowaki and um, they're sharp they're very pointy you do have to be careful with them I have dropped them near my feet um, but yeah constantly with snips in my pocket every I do carry holsters when we're we're working a lot but I've got most of my um, working trousers now I've got long side pockets down my thigh for, for we've got one side for the phone the other side for the snips and I buy these these trousers on, on purpose because they've got these ones down my thighs so I don't have things it, not on your backside so they pop out or get sat on or anything like that and so always got snips okay all right thanks Rhiannon what about you I think probably the same. So I've got mine on. I'm going to stand up now. So I have my pouch. I was out cutting this morning. <laughs> so I always have my pouch with me because otherwise I get holes in my back pockets of my jeans. I said, or I'm putting them down and then forever looking for them. So probably for me, secateurs. Again, I use Nowaki. I have these lovely ones, which I use all the time. Um, I do also have their red snips, which are great for fine things like um, scabious and stuff like that. Um, yeah, because if you can't cut the flowers, then you don't really have a business, do you? So I think probably these guys are my pouch, so I don't lose them all the time. Have you got anything different, Sarah? Or would you say snips too? I'd say snips and I'd say uh, my tool belt. But my Hori Hori knife is probably one of my favourite tools. Um, it's a Japanese tool, again, from Nuwaki, funnily enough. <laughs> Um, we're not sponsored by them, but we just generally we quite like them. Um, so I have a hori hori knife, which is really useful in the growing side of the flower farming. Um, really good for uh, weeding. You can plant with it. You can do all sorts, but just watch the edges because um, they are very sharp. But um, yeah, my hori hori knife, um, my snips, my tool belt. Yeah, that's probably it. Oh, sharpening. A sharpener. Because it doesn't matter how good your snips are, once you've used them a little bit, they stop being sharp. So a really good sharpener and learning how to use the sharpener properly. I think I'd have to add my trusty wheelbarrow to the list as I'm known for always trundling through the streets of Bourneville with my wheelbarrow full of flowers or plants as I'm coming backwards and forwards from the allotment. So something different for you there. Okay, our next question is, do you supply flowers and foliage all year round or do you stop? for winter. Sarah, as you're here, what do you say? <laughs> um, I don't stop for winter, but I don't always supply it myself. But I do use British Grown all year round. Um, we're very lucky that in the 10 years that I've been growing, there are new wholesalers who have come on board for selling British flowers. Um, so I do use, I don't know if I'm allowed to say names of wholesalers or not, but I do use a couple of um, British wholesalers. and. They specialise in British only as well. 
Um, so I'll buy from those for flowers. I don't do as much in the winter. Um, I normally end up very busy doing Christmas wreath workshops um, and they are great fun and I really love running them. So I do a lot of those. So I don't do as many bouquets necessarily, but there are still amazing British flowers around all year round, but not necessarily growing on my patch. Okay. Rhiannon, how about you? Um, I don't think we ever really stop, do we? <laughs> um, uh, I don't tend to supply flowers through probably the end of December and then maybe January and February. That tends to be my quietest in terms of supply. Um, I do Christmas wreath workshops as well, running right up until about the middle of December. Um, but then during that downtime or whatever you want to call it, I tend to do a lot of maintenance. So as I'm still a young business, I'm still building a lot of raised beds because we're on heavy clay here. So I know I've already got a list of jobs to do now through the winter that I, you know, I've made beds out of willow, which are collapsing. So I need to replace them, you know, things like that. So we don't tend to stop in terms of terms of work, but I do tend to have a quiet downtime um, in terms of actually selling flowers. Okay. And Carol, how about you? I'm ex exactly the same um, as Rhiannon, really, uh, that we do, we have to do maintenance and I have to tell you the maintenance never stops. <laughs> There's always something else that you have to do in the winter that we need to build that time in. Um, having said that, we have a lot of evergreen foliage and we do have lots of fl uh, flowers and shrubs which flower through the winter. So I'll, if um, I want to do a winter wedding and I do occasionally do those, then I'll, I'll either buy little bits to add in or I'll use dried, we dry a lot and I'll use dried combined with fresh stuff that we've got around. But I do, and Christmas wreath workshops too, but I do quite like to have certainly the last two weeks of December and most of January off. Okay. <laughs> Catch up, I keep saying. Go to, the, go to the cinema in the daytime and things like that is what. That's I think you've earned it after your busy season. <laughs> Okay, um, all right then. Next question is to dig or not to dig? This is the question. Um, who would like to go first on that? Anybody? Sarah? <laughs> I don't mind. Um, I try to do no dig. I think it's probably the best way to do it. Um, but for me, getting hold of enough um, organic material to do the mulches is quite difficult. So I, I don't dig and turn over soil and I do use a lot of covering um, so cardboard or um, membrane to keep the weeds down but I struggle sometimes to get hold of enough compost organic matter to do the actual large no dig bed mulches but I've been storing wood chip for a few years now and so I'm now able to start using the first lot that was delivered sort of three three or four years ago as organic mulch so that's been helpful this year and it definitely does make a difference I wish I could get hold of more um, less seedy organic material I can get hold of manure but it's full of seed so it doesn't necessarily help me out as much as I would like but I think the no dig principle definitely does work so I want to do more of it. Okay Rhiannon how about you? Um, yeah same here no dig as much as I can but we are unfortunately up a single lane with a gravel drive and nobody will deliver on pallets and I haven't found anybody who would deliver any quantity of compost here at all uh, so that's a real challenge um, but I'm very excited because I finally seem to have nailed my composting process and getting it up to 60 degrees which kills the seeds off because I was having the same problem with my homemade compost with um, seeds it, you just put it down and then a week later it would just be a green fuzz and it was just a nightmare they're trying to plant anything into it so thank goodness finally getting the temperatures right to kill it off and that seems to be working really well but I just can't produce enough but again, I don't dig, so definitely go for a no dig system. I just think it's much kinder on the planet. Okay, come on. Yes, we don't dig either. I haven't dug. When we came here, it had been arable, so it had already been ploughed. So, but we there were areas that we grassed down, and then we've had to incorporate those. So, if it's a really dense turf to start with, I have dug that in because it just gets you going a lot quicker, I think, without having the volumes of compost that you said. And it is the biggest issue is getting those sheer volumes. 
we can get um, council municipal green waste. We can get that at the moment, although my supplier this lead told me this is the last load that we're going to get. So that's going to be a problem for us. And we use straw and we use our own compost and we do use quite a lot of plastic permeable membrane mulches, weed resistant type things. But we buy really good quality and they've been we've been using them the whole time that we've been here. So we look after them and we and I, I, my soil is very light. So if it gets rained on over winter, all the organic matter just disappears and it turns into grey dust by spring. So the plastic really for me helps me to protect my soil. So I, it's although it's uh, I don't like using plastic for me to farm here it really saves on a lot of work and other inputs that I'd have to put in. So yeah, no dig all the way. My mum's been you know, taught me no dig in the 60s, 70s. You know, it's been around for a very long time as a principle. Um, and it certainly is a way to build up a very healthy soil. Okay, thank you. Um, right, our next question is all about dahlias. What are the best dahlias to grow as cut flowers and do you have any tips for growing dahlias? Carol, as you're here, I'll let yeah. you go first. <laughs> um, I think, well, it comes back to what you want, doesn't it? So as a cut flower, if you want to sell dahlias to put in bouquets, the best ones are the ball types because they have the longest vase life. So anything which is a ball shape or the pom-poms, and I wrote down a few of my favourites, actually, because I knew this question was coming, because I can never remember when I'm on the spot. Oh, one called Peaches, um, or one called Linda's Baby, which I think they're very, very similar. Uh, Pink Silk is another one I like, and Golden Scepter, because I like strong yellow. Um, so those are all really good ones if you want to be selling them. But personally, I really like Singles, and the semi doubles and the collarettes where you can see the center so if i were growing them for my house i'd use those and if i'm growing them for weddings i use those but they're not great they don't have great vase life so they probably only last maybe three or four days compared to perhaps five seven eight days even for the ball types so but i really am not a fan of the massive big dinner plates i know lots of people are um and they look they are really stunning but for me i prefer smaller uh, more intricate, more interesting shapes. Okay, Rhiannon, how about you? Um, I've not grown a huge number. I've invested in quite a few this year um, to try out, so it's been very interesting. I think the first one of my new ones that's come up is Preference, and that's been really amazing. I quite like the lily-shaped dahlias. Um, I've got a really gorgeous, deep burgundy one called After Dusk which I love and has done particularly well. It does well in the tunnel and outside as well. Um, it does seem to have quite a good vase life. Um, and one I Jill is another one that I've found does particularly well inside and out as well. So I'm still, they're my ones, they're my top ones probably is After Dusk and One I Jill. They're colours that I know my florists like and they seem to do very well in a vase as well and inside and outside, which is always helpful. So. Sarah, have you got any favourites or any top tips for growing dahlias? Um, I'm a bit like Carol. I wrote down a few because we knew this question was coming. Um, so Burlesca is one I love. Um, Eternal Snow is a lovely white one. Uh, preference, as Rhiannon mentioned. There's, but again, it depends what you're using them for. So my personal preference, preference um, is for more sort of dual tones and deep colours. But my wedding work tends to demand more sort of paler tones and um, blush and peaches so it depends what you're growing for if you want um, retail bouquets or for your own house or for wedding work but I'm I'm a bit lazy when it comes to dahlias I don't dig them up most of mine are in raised beds um, and what I found when I was beginning that I would lose more dahlias by digging them up and trying to store them. I'm obviously not very good at storing them. So I now leave them in. But what I tend to do is buy a few new ones every year. So I have a sort of general population that come back quite reliably, which is great. And they're, they're my sort of stalwarts that I love. Um, and then I always buy a few new extra ones to try out. The Karma series were particularly bred for using in cut flowers um, and I do actually love karma chalk 
Um, it's one I never want to be without, apart from anything else, because it smells of chocolate. So I think that's quite a nice thing to have in a bouquet, a flower that smells of chocolate. Um, and uh, is it Naomi? Karma Naomi is one, but I, and there's another one that I like. So I do grow quite a few of the Karma ones. Um, but top tip is just don't necessarily do what they say in the books. Just try it, see what works on your soil, see if leaving them in works, um, see what works for you. you. If you're growing on a larger scale, you can buy the tubers reasonably. reasonably. Um, so don't feel you have to do it exactly as the book says to, to get away with good production. Carol, do you leave your dailies in over winter or do you dig yours up? No, I left them. I realised I didn't answer any of the growing questions, sorry. <laughs> carried away with varieties. Um, no, we, I left all mine, but that's because I can't afford to lose them. So there's a lot that I've selected over the years. So even within particular varieties, very often you find that they're, they're quite variable. So I'll have three or four or five plants of the same variety and they look quite different. So I'll label and choose the one that I like most and that's the one that I'll keep and I'll propagate from for subsequent years. So I've spent a long time building them up into what I want, what I like, the ones I use. Some of them I don't use because they've been given to me. Um, so they're quite precious to me. So I do lift them and we can do it in a day. I give myself a day. We've got about 250, uh, approaching 300 dahlias. So I give myself, and they're all in um, particular uh, plots and I know how long it takes me and we have a we get ready for it and we lift them all in a day and we can plant them all in a day and it's we can do it less than a day now but I, I allow a day because then I feel pleased and I can have an ice cream when I finish early. <laughs> I think you've earned it if you do it in a day. <laughs> We're growing them on light sandy soil which everybody says they don't like but I think in terms of growing them it's just giving them we give them lots of compost so we do use compost on them and we mulch them quite heavily to keep the weeds down. Although once they get big, they outcompete the weeds. So lots of feed and lots of water. We feed them as well with um, nettle tea and seaweed tea. We haven't got comfrey, enough comfrey really, but you can make teas and make natural feeds just to give them a bit of, bit of a boost. And, and then they, once they get to about this time of the year, by the end of July, we stop feeding them because they're up and running by then. And so water, feed, bit of space. Okay, lovely, thanks. And um, Pippa Brock's asters, um, what top perennials would you invest in for cutting? Perennials with a good vase life. Sara, what do you think for perennials? Um, well, I've got one here. Uh, this is a perennial sweet pea and the pink one I find doesn't last well in a vase. But these, the white ones, I think it's white pearl. I'm not very good on remembering names, but I think it might be white pearl. It's brilliant. It lasts really well. The only problem is they're quite short, the individual stem, but I cut them on the vine and then put the vine into a bouquet um, or an installation, and they're brilliant. Veronica is a huge cutter for me. I love Veronica, um, and I often get more than one cut off each plant. Um, Verbena brunariensis. Uh, it goes with darks, it goes with brights, it goes with pales, it goes in anything. Um, Astrantia? I don't know, there's so many. I, I've invested quite heavily in perennials because they're just, they give you that sort of backbone and uh, continuity of flowers. It's, I wouldn't be without perennials, but there's so many. Okay. All right. Um, Carol, any top tips for perennials? Yeah, we grow lots of perennials. <laughs> I really like perennials. I probably, I mean, I did gardening before, so I was used to uh, garden type perennials. Um, but I really go for anything which I can grow from seed or I can grow from cuttings or I can divide. So really good, reliable, easy to grow, vigorous plants. So, and things are not fancy cultivars because usually you can't propagate them and they're the things that die after a year or whatever. So I don't grow all the specialist varieties. I just grow. Have you got any particular favourites that Sarah's not already? Yeah. Made? So I, for me, on our soil, I grow lots of achillea, lots of different colours of achillea, and they actually grow for about four or five years for me. Um, and I can, but I can propagate them really easily. Astrantia, as Sarah said, everybody loves astrantia, and it's got all sort of different shades, and it goes in lots of colour schemes. Um, mint 
lots of herbs actually mint and oregano are my favorites and i'm using those in everything at the moment because i've got lots of different varieties of mints that are coming up they've been purple and now they're going into i've got white ones and different uh, leaf colors um but they i love putting mint into wedding flowers because the scent is there in the marquee and it, particularly if they're on tables it makes me smile because i think though it's going to make everybody hungry and they do it makes you hungry when you can smell it when you walk in and i also sometimes put borage in because that also makes me smile because it's supposed to be good for head uh, hangovers <laughs> it's just i amuse myself nobody else knows uh, but i also like anything with a leaf scent so nepitas i really love nepitas so anything herby again we've got sandy soil so a lot of these mediterranean herby, bluey, lilac-y, lovely scented plants, all the insects love too. Mm -hmm. So Rhiannon, what, what perennials love your soil? Oh, and heavy clay. Um, what does particularly, well, my Achilles have been amazing this year <laughs> and I grew them all from seed last year. So I've brought in some new different colour and varieties because they've just been total troopers. And so just the, the ability to be able to grow something from like a couple of quid packet of seed for an entire bed of colour is just, it, blo it it's like magic. It blows my mind every time. Um, what else have I got? For me, I can't get enough foliage. Just, I, I think we all have this problem. I'm quite lucky. We've got a very well established garden here that I do cut from a lot. But God, I wish I put in a lot more foliage plants about a year ago. Oh because they just take a little while to get established, but once they get going, you can just cut and cut and cut. Do you have um, a favourite foliage? A favourite foliage? I do love the Pittosporum, but it's so slow. So I don't like to cut it too much. Um, I love ferns. We've got some brilliant ferns here that I cut quite regularly that hold up well. I've tested everything as well, because I don't know exactly what I've got in the front garden. I always bring some into the house for myself and make a note of how long because also I know that like on different soil types, like it'll last maybe a week for Carol and maybe two days for Sarah and only a couple of days for me as well. Like it depends on where you are and the growing conditions as well. So always test what you've got. Mm -hmm. um, goldenrod is particularly good at the moment. That's been amazing. And I've grown Selectrum as well, which has flowered beautifully this year. And that is just for weddings. I'm so excited to use it in weddings. It's just like, yeah, it's just beautiful. It's so delicate. It's much nicer than gypsophilia because it doesn't smell awful as well. <laughs> um, yeah, I think those are probably, again, there's just too many to choose from. Like, I have a wish list of perennials that's as long as my arm. Yeah, and while I've still got you here, the burning question that everybody always wants to know the answer to, what about slugs? What about slugs? About them. <laughs> slugs, they're a pain in the backside. <laughs> um... Touchwood, we've been okay. We've not been too bad, I think, because we had quite a dry spring, didn't we? So we seem to have quite a long period where the plants were getting reasonably established that I didn't have too many problems, thank goodness. Um, I do use um, the organic slug pellets occasionally, just when I first put things out, just as a barrier. Um, but most of the time, I kind of just leave them to it. I just pull them off. And I don't tend to kill them, I tend to just throw them. We've got lots of fields here. I tend to just whack them into the fields or I give them to the chickens because I have chickens here as well. Um, I do think no dig has helped and I tidy up around the bottom of the plants a lot. So I try and remove any dead or damaged leaves quite regularly. Um, and that does seem to help because they're not attracted there so much by any decaying um, debris and things like that. So. Okay, thanks. Carol, have you got any expert tips for getting rid of slugs or dealing with them? Well, we, um, I get a lot, I don't get that many slugs out in the open because it's quite sunny and windy and I think it's too hot really here. And we use a lot of the membrane, which um, you can get slugs underneath it. Um, but I think in, particularly when it gets hot, it's too hot in there for them. And also the, the green waste, the compost that we use, I don't particularly like that. So like Rhiannon, I try to keep it fairly clear of lots and lots of weeds. Um, but if you do, I, the only time I would use those uh, slug pellets, and again, I'd use the organic ones, is if I'm planting something which is really susceptible, like uh, larkspur or delphiniums or something like that. And what um, a delphinium grower once told me was not to put the slugs around the plant you're trying to protect because the, slug, the pellets act as an attractant. So they draw the slugs into that plant that you're trying to protect. So if I'm putting a bed in, 
I'll just put the, a few little slug pellets around the edge of the bed and he, you only need a few, you don't need a great big handful. And literally I'd kind of put like six slug pellets around the corners of the bed or something like that. So I'm hoping to draw the slugs away from the plants towards the, the pellets. So very little, we do have hedgehogs here, so I'm very wary of that. And we have at the moment only one hen because we are, we're down to one because <laughs> she's really old. She's been here as long as we have. Um, but she does go around uh, catching them. But I think um, Zara has a good tip for slugs. Zara? <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to be that popular, I don't think. Um, uh, yes, I have been known to have stated an opinion on social media about how I deal with slugs and it might involve scissors, um, which generally most people get very squeamish and horrible about and don't like, but um, it depends. At the moment, touch wood, quick, because as soon as I say it, something will happen. Um, I'm not really overrun with slugs at the flower patch. They're decimating my lettuce here at home, but at the flower patch, they're not really doing too much damage, but I have got Indian runner ducks. So I think that's part of what's keeping them uh, slightly at bay. So because I've got the Indian runner ducks, although I do have the organic slug pellets, I don't tend to use them anymore because um, I read some stuff that they may not be as good in the food chain as it's made out to be. So I just don't want to risk, uh, apart from anything else, we're eating the eggs from the Indian runner ducks. So I definitely don't want to risk anything getting into the food chain. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, t keeping it tidy, keeping it clean and tidy. And I do think the no dig helps. Okay, all right. Well, thank you all very much for sharing your advice and top tips. It's been a pleasure having you here. And um, yeah, I hope you will all enjoy the Flower Farmers Big Weekend. Look forward to seeing various videos. And uh, if you want to find your local flower farmer, please hop over to www.flowersfromthefarm.co.uk and see if you can find a grower near you. Um, we hope you are all staying happy and healthy in lockdown and uh, yes good luck with all your flower growing in the forthcoming year thank you